Now, sometimes the best way to get your brain around any reading from Scripture is to look at it in several different translations. Sometimes we like to roost on one particular translation or another, like the New Revised Standard Version or the NIV or the King James Version or the Old Revised Standard Version or the American Standard Version. Lots of different translations. My dad's favorite translation was the Moffat Bible, which was a very fascinating product of the mid-20th century. And here today we have a very interesting excursion through many different translations, if you would want to, of the first verse of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. For instance, the Revised English Bible, verse 1 reads, Faith gives substance to our hopes and convinces us of realities we do not see. Huh. The New International Version reads, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Hmm. The contemporary English version reads, faith makes us sure of what we hope for and gives us proof of what we cannot see. Today's English version reads, to have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. <laughs> Holman's Christian Standard Bible says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. The, the New Jerusalem Bible reads, Only faith can guarantee the blessings that we hope for. That's the New Jerusalem Bible. Only faith can guarantee the blessings that we hope for or prove the existence of realities that are unseen. The message, some people really like the message. The message, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything and makes life worth living. It is our handle on things we can't see. Hmm. The New Living Translation. Some people really decry the Living Bible. Here's the New Living Bible. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. The King James, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or as on our reading today, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You, you heard lots of different renderings of this verse. They're all very similar, and yet they're all different in one way or another. Faith gives substance. Faith is being sure. Faith makes us sure. Faith is to be sure. Faith is the reality. Faith can guarantee the blessings. Faith is the firm foundation under everything. Faith is the confidence. Faith is the subject, substance. Faith is the assurance. Interesting collection of words. And notice all of these concepts, substance, being sure of, surety of, reality of, guarantee of, firm foundation of, confidence of, substance of, and assurance of is all of things hoped for. Interesting. Faith is the assurance, the substance of things hoped for, the firm foundation of things hoped for. Faith and hope are two sides of the same coin in Greek. The word pistis in, in, in Greek is the noun faith. Elpis is the noun hope. Pistis, elpis. There's a common root in those two words. And it means trust. It means trust. Trust, belief, but not just passive belief. Active, trusting, responding belief. Belief that is in action. Belief that is functional. 
Belief that changes things. Belief that changes us. Belief that enables us to change things for others. Belief that is living, not dead. Belief that is alive, not dead. Now, every year I preach, at least once a year, a sermon on the meaning of faith. Brian, could you bring the chair up here? Yeah? Third time. Third time. Now, here's the chair. Thank you, Brian. Here's the chair. It's made of metal. Nice and solid. Has a nice pad for the posterior in the back. You know, I really think that this chair, solid as it is, I think this chair will support my weight. I believe it. I've experienced many chairs just like this chair. I know, I believe it can support my weight. I'm a big guy, but that chair made of metal, I think it will support me. But instead of sitting in the chair, I'm going to go over here and sit in John's lap. You ready, John? Now, is that faith in the chair? No. That is not faith in the chair. It might be faith in John's lap. I'm sorry, John. It might be faith in John's lap. But it's not faith in that chair. Faith in that chair is believing that it will hold me, having past experiences that chairs just like this one, and maybe even this chair last year, Chairs just like this one have supported me or have supported others of you. It's taking that belief and the confidence that is oriented around that belief and then putting that belief into action by actually sitting in the chair. One of these days the chair's going to collapse on me. It's going to run the sermon, isn't it? <laughs> now that, my brothers and sisters, is faith. It's the belief the chair will hold me put into action. It's, it's the, the belief that this chair will hold me, will support me, will hold my weight, and will survive it. Slamming it to the floor didn't help one of the little studs in the bottom of the leg. It kind of busted <laughs> that. But the chair itself is intact, and it held my weight. That's faith. That's even more faith. I could jump up and down on it. It'd be a lot of faith. It'd be stupid, but it'd be a lot of faith. That's faith. It's faith in the chair that it will support me. And until I sit in it, it's not faith. It's belief, but it's not true trust until you act on it. The instant you act on it, and while you're acting on it, it's faith. When you stop, it's no longer faith. I actually have a little bit of faith on the chair right now because I'm leaning on it. That's a kind of faith. That's a part of faith. Faith is taking your belief. Here, Brian. Faith is taking your belief. Come get it. Come on. Come on. <laughs> faith is taking your belief and putting it into action. And it can be in almost anything. But if you place your trust upon it, and you place your life upon it, if you place your weight upon it, you live your life by it, you live according to that belief, it is faith. Hmm. It's faith. Now, Hebrew has several words for faith. The first word, all of you know. You say it every time you say a prayer. When you come to the end of the prayer, you say, Amen. And that is the first and most important Hebrew word for faith. Amen. It means, so be it. I will hang my life upon it. I will trust in it and depend upon it that God will make it happen. That is a statement of faith. And so be it. Amen. 
is a statement of faith. Using the Hebrew ultimate word for faith. There are other words in Hebrew for faith. Bata and mitba, hasa and mase, galal and others. They all tend to have concepts like trust, rest, fortress, defense, shield. Concepts that indicate our ability to trust in that in which it's focused, usually God. Can we trust in God? Well, chapter 11 of Hebrews provides a list, a recitation, a catalog of people throughout the Hebrew Bible, throughout the Hebrew experience, who had faith. Often we think about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as a book of of law and rules and regulations and a God of justice, but not much faith. I'm sorry, but no, almost every single instance here in chapter 11 takes us through people from the Hebrew experience, the Hebrew Bible, who lived by faith. When you determine the declination of the word for faith here in Hebrew, in the book of Hebrew, Hebrews, the declina- declination, it is a dative case. Dative has indirect object concepts, place or location concepts, and instrumental means concept. And here we have faith is the instrumental means. By faith. And repeatedly throughout the letter of the Hebrews, and especially in chapter 11, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, he stayed for a time. By faith, he received power of procreation. Again and again and again throughout the letter, every person mentioned in this catalog of faith heroes acted by faith by means of faith, by the instrumentality of faith. And in so doing, their trust in God was established. Their faith gave substance to their life. It made their life sure in their hope for God. It brought the reality of their belief into action in what they hoped for. Their faith was guaranteeing the blessings that God had for them. That's true with Abraham. I mean, he struggled against it. Sarah struggled against the promises. They tried to get God's will done for God their way because they couldn't figure out how God could do it God's way because they were old and, and, and Sarah was barren. But when they finally trusted in God and acted in faith, God worked a miracle, and Isaac was conceived and born. Likewise, even though the circumstances look like they may be dire for us, even though it looks like there's no way God can work a miracle, there's no way God can do it, there's no way God can move in and intervene in our lives, there's no way that God's presence can be known in our lives, there's no way that God's grace can be received in our lives. In those moments, if we will only trust in God, If we will only exercise faith, we will experience that hope and we will experience the conviction of those things that are unseen, the presence of God in our lives. That we know when we feel, we can see around us and the people we love and the community that we love and the calling that we have, but when someone asks us for proof where I can describe it, maybe I can tell you how it feels, but I can't point to it. It's kind of like love. I had an atheist ask me, if you can't point to it, it's not real. I said, okay, prove to me that your mother loves you. You can't do it. You can point to things your mother does. I can point to things that God does for me through people and through this universe. But the things that your mother does doesn't really prove that she loves you. She may have ulterior motives. She may want to make sure that you're going to take care of her in her old age. So she's going to make sure that you're going to take care of her by lavishing things upon you and telling you that she loves you. 
Well, if you're going to be as skeptical about my faith in God, why not the other way around? You can't point to love. You can think, point to things that love produces, but you can't point to love, likewise. You can point to the things that God produces, but you can't point to God. And that's where faith comes in. Trusting in the things you cannot see. Knowing and experiencing the reality of that which you cannot see, and yet know to be true because it is alive in your life. And that's where the means of grace come in for Methodist Christians and Anglican Christians and Lutheran Christians and Roman Catholic Christians. This concept that God will use an instrumentality like a remote control, like a cell phone, an instrumentality to convey to us information or for us grace, love, favor, joy, peace. So that when we're facing surgical procedures, Rebecca, we'll know that God is with us even in the midst of it. And in here, we'll have an assurance that no matter what happens, God holds us close. The means of grace are those instrumentalities that God gives us to convey to us grace. Reading of Scripture, prayer, worship, giving to God and others, service to God and others, fellowshipping together, fasting, confession of sin to God, the sacrament of Holy Communion, the remembrance of our baptisms. These are means of grace, baptism itself. These are means of grace, instruments through which God conveys to us His love, His favor. They become foci for our faith. And when we partake of them, when we act upon them, when we function them in our lives, do them, partake of them, receive them, engage in them, we're acting in faith, trusting in God, and receiving the love and favor, the grace and peace that God wants to give us, desires to give us pleads with us to accept, if only we will say yes. Today, when you come to the table of the Lord, I want to encourage you to come and to kneel and to eat and to drink and to receive the blessed sacrament and to know the real presence of Christ in your life and by faith to receive through this conduit of God's grace the love of God that will transform us and bind us close with each other and with God in communion for all eternity. Partake of this means of grace as we've partaken of prayer, as we've partaken of singing and hymns, as we've partaken of fellowship, as we've partaken of study, as we've partaken of the reading of scriptures, as we've partaken right in this instant of preaching, as we've partaken of giving and service. Partake of the sacrament and receive the love of God in the real presence of Jesus Christ our Lord that can truly, miraculously provide us the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction, the evidence, our handle on our proof of that unseen and yet known to be true. Come to the table of the Lord and be fed by Jesus Christ our Lord. And have your faith fueled, empowered, enlivened, and have your hope brought to fruition. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Son, Jesus Christ, your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made, the, made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave the cup to his disciples, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ the God of heaven. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. <laughs> Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And when we give thanks over the cup, we are reconnected to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Not for our sins only, for the sins of the whole world. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2016 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.